The whole theme for our Advent worship is going to be when the Lord comes near. You, you see it on the cover of our service folder. But if you stop for a moment and think, what does it look like when the Lord comes near? Here's an example from the Old Testament of when the Lord came near his people. On the morning of the third day, there was thunder and lightning and with a thick cloud over the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast. Everyone in the camp trembled. Then Moses led the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord descended on it in fire. The smoke billowed up from it like smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain trembled violently. At the sound of the trumpet, as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and the voice of God answered him. When the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain in smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. But do not have God speak to us or we will die. When the Lord comes near, even God's people end up terrified. Right, the Israelites, as they, they stood at the base of Mount Sinai, and as God comes to them to, to, to stand among them, makes the Israelites so terrified, they say, don't have God speak to us anymore, Moses. Have God speak to you, and you tell us what, what God says, because God's presence among us is a little overwhelming. God tells us, that the Lord is going to return one day. That the Lord is going to come near again. And, and listen how God describes it. First in the book of Matthew. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. John, in Revelation, describes the same thing. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Even as a believer, knowing that my Lord is coming back to see my Savior return with the armies of heaven, with trumpet blasts from angels, is probably going to have caused my heart to skip a beat or two, huh? Why is it? Why is it that when the Lord comes near, the first reaction that people have is one of terror and fear. I think we can boil it down to one simple word, right? Sin. The reason you and I are terrified anytime the Holy Lord draws near is because He is perfect and we are sinful. And we know, and God tells us, that sinners can't live in the presence of God. And so when that comes, when that Lord comes and draws near, the overwhelming feeling is one of fear and terror and trembling and mourning. Because I know what should happen. In fact, the psalm writer mentions and talks about, well, how God looks at sinners. 
and the reason why sinners and God can't exist. He says, for you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence. You hate all who do wrong. In other words, as you and I begin to examine our lives and we recognize the fact that sin and, and, and a holy God cannot exist together, and I begin to hear how God looks at sinners, right, that he's not pleased with wickedness, can't stand arrogance, you hate all who do wrong, it isn't just that God hates sin, but God hates the sinner because of their sin. Right? I hear those words from the psalmist, and I look at the other portions of Scripture which talk about how that sin is such a part of me that it's corrupted me so much so that it's not just my actions, but well, the very thoughts and, of my heart and the motivations that go along with it that are, are just so corrupted by sin. There isn't a single moment in my life that you and I should be terrified. Because we know that that God is a God who sees all, and knows all. A God who doesn't just see our actions, but sees the very thoughts and, and motivations of our heart and our mind. He knows why we do the things that we do. And for that reason, I should be terrified. Why right? We should react the same way people throughout history have reacted when the Lord draws near. Terrified. Because we know our sin, and we know that our God knows our sin. And therefore, I have no reason to want to stand before a perfect, holy God. So why is it, then, that you and I as believers, when we read those words from, from Revelation or from Matthew, about when the Lord is going to come back, it doesn't fill our hearts with fear. Why is it that we are able to think about our Lord drawing near and our hearts aren't filled with abject terror, but instead filled with joy and anticipation and eagerness as we wait for our Savior to come back? Well, it's, it's all because of what happens in our Gospel lesson this morning. It's all because our king humbles himself and draws near to us. You see, before coming as the king who judges, Jesus comes as the king who saves. And it's not the way you and I would probably expect. Right? When, when Jesus comes that first time, well, he comes in humility. It isn't the picture that we read in Revelation of, of armies following their Savior, leader. No, Jesus comes and he takes on human flesh and blood and looks just like you and me. In fact, the prophet Isaiah, right before he goes into that, that beautiful section in Isaiah 53 where he talks about you know, how he has taken our sins on himself and the punishment, Isaiah describes Jesus as, well, there was nothing, it describes him in such a way that there would be nothing that would draw you and I to him. Looking at Jesus, there isn't anything that would suddenly say, oh, here is the Son of God. Here is the Savior. Now, there were glimpses, weren't there? As he's born in Bethlehem, suddenly angels from heaven announce his birth as they say, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men. There's glimpses throughout Jesus' life, right? Miracles. God speaking from heaven. Jesus' own words declaring himself to be that Savior that God had promised. But for the most part, you wouldn't be able to tell that this was the King of kings and Lord of lords because, well, our King humbled himself. And so much so that on one particular Sunday, 
As the Israelites were about to celebrate and, and rejoice in the deliverance God had brought to them through, uh, by rescuing them and delivering them from their slavery in Egypt, that, that king comes and enters Jerusalem, not on that white horse with armies following him, but instead on a donkey. In ancient times, kings, as they returned from a military campaign, would, if they were victorious, would ride on a donkey. Being able to show that there weren't any, any enemies left, that a war horse was no longer needed, that enemies had been defeated, there were no more threats, there was peace. And it showed because, while well, they were riding on a donkey, Jesus enters Jerusalem on a donkey before he defeats his enemies. In fact, he enters into the very stronghold of his enemies, where instead of as a victorious king will watch his enemies being killed before him, instead he goes and hands himself into the hands of the enemies who will kill him. And he does it all for a very specific purpose, doesn't he? He humbles himself. He sets aside the full use of his power and glory as the Son of God and takes on human flesh for one reason. You. The reason the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes to earth, sets aside the power and glory that is his as the Son of God, is you. And look at what he does. He suffers and he dies. It's not as though there weren't glimpses of what was happening, even at Jesus' suffering and death, right? There's earthquakes. The curtain in the temple tears in two. The sun refuses to shine for three hours. And then with a simple word in the Greek, to tell aside, three in English, and a last breath, it's done. Right? Jesus says, it's finished. On the cross, he had experienced the very depths of hell. He that experienced that separation from God and his love because he had taken every last one of your sins, every last one of your failures, everything that makes you terrified to stand before God. Jesus takes as his own and goes to a cross and proclaims it's finished. It's paid in full. And as a result, what is there? What is there when every enemy is defeated? When every threat is taken care of? Peace. Right? It's why the angels at Jesus' birth proclaimed glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. The angels were proclaiming the mission that the Savior, who was just born in Bethlehem, had come to accomplish. It's why as Jesus is entering Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on that donkey, people are proclaiming peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Here is the one who is bringing peace between God and man. Here is the one who with his perfect life and his death on the cross has paid for every last sin so that you can be at peace with God. A Savior who comes and reconciles himself to rebellious sinners so that when the Lord draws near, there isn't fear or terror, but instead peace. And because he comes as the king who saves, when he comes as the king who will judge, we'll have nothing to fear. Right? And it changes our perspective now of looking forward to when our Lord comes near the second time. I can hear all those fantastic pictures of what it's going to be like on that last day when our Savior comes, and they don't fill my heart with fear and trepidation or worry or anything because, well, I'm at peace. 
I am at peace with God. And if I'm at peace with God, I know that when my Savior comes back, I have nothing to fear. Because my sin has been paid for, I can stand in the presence of God Almighty by myself. And watch as my Savior opens up that book and doesn't see my sin, but instead sees it as being paid in full by a Savior who came and humbled himself to live and die in my place. When the Lord draws near, he teaches us a bit about humility, doesn't he? It's what we're going to hear about the, the next couple of weeks, because as we continue to see what happens when the Lord comes near, we see a, a Lord who doesn't come as we expect, but a Lord who sets aside power and glory that are His as the Son of God in order to, well, defeat His enemies. And He defeats His enemies not with war horses and, and massive armies, but with gentleness and surrender. He comes in compassion and mercy and humility. And then as we're going to hear next week, he teaches his followers the same thing. When the Lord comes near, we see a, a God who's powerful and mighty, but doesn't approach us that way. Instead, we see a Savior who comes near in love and forgiveness. So that when the Lord comes near, what's on our hearts is joy and praise because we are at peace. And as a result, we sing peace on earth and glory to God in the highest. Amen. And that peace of God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.